Thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you also, Sabina, and everybody at WIMA for inviting me along to this morning's conference. It's so wonderful to be here in a room full of interested people. Um, I've been asked to do quite a few presentations over the last couple of years since I published a book. It's actually the bottom right-hand one there, Why Mindfulness is Better Than Chocolate. Now, this is a deliberately provocative title. Um, many people's instinctive reaction to that is, oh, no, it's not, uh, which is precisely what I wanted people to think. But there's actually a little bit of a story behind that title. Um, a few weeks after first coming across it, I went to the gym and had a bit of a, a good session, came back all pumped up with endorphins. And I said to my wife, I've had this better, even better idea for a title of this book. Why mindfulness is better than sex? And she looked up at me, she was busy working on a laptop, and she said, I thought your readers were mostly uh, mature-aged women. And I said, yes, they are. She said, stick with the chocolate. <laughs> so what I hope to do this morning uh, is briefly run through this definition of mindfulness. We hear this term used so much these days, mindfulness, meditation. What do we actually mean by it? I'd then like to explain a bit about the benefits of why would you be interested in practicing mindfulness both personally and professionally? And what are the benefits to organizations that actually courageously embark on a mindfulness program? And at the end of the session, I actually want to lead you through a guided meditation so that by the time you go out to coffee, you'll just be able to float down the escalators to the terrace ballroom feeling wonderfully calm and relaxed. Because the thing about mindfulness and meditation is you can read all the books you like on the subject of it. You can be across it cognitively and intellectually, but it's actually of no benefit whatsoever unless you practice it. It really is all in the practice. So what is mindfulness? Uh, the most commonly and widely accepted definition of mindfulness is paying attention to the present moment deliberately and non-judgmentally. So there are three parts to that definition. You might say, well, what else would I be paying attention to apart from the present moment? And the reality is that Harvard Psychology Department did a really fascinating study a few years ago involving 2,000 smartphone owners. And they sent these owners three different questions at different times of the day and the night. The questions were, what are you doing? What are you thinking? And how happy are you? And interestingly enough, 47% of the time, people reported they were not thinking about what they were doing. They were thinking about something else. Personally, I think that's probably a bit of an underreport. I think it's hard, far likely it's 50 to 60%, but let's say around half the time, we're not actually thinking about what we're doing, we're thinking about something else. The other fascinating correlation here was it was the people who said they were thinking about what they were doing who had the highest levels, self-reported levels of happiness. So it's actually quite, kind of interesting that it's not what you're doing necessarily that makes you happy, it's whether or not you are present with that experience, whether you're paying attention to it. So when we practice mindfulness, we are deliberately focusing our mind on a particular thing, whatever it is that we're doing, and we'd all benefit from that incidentally throughout the day without the need to practice meditation. If we were more mindful of washing dishes when we're washing dishes, of going to the toilet when we're going to the toilet, of walking to the car when we're walking to the car, we would find subjectively, although our, the actual um, content of our day doesn't change, our subjective experience of our day would change quite dramatically and we'd have a greater sense of peacefulness and, and time. Uh, rather than this constant freneticism, because we're, we're always engaged in what psych neuroscientists ca call the narrative state. We're in, our narr we're in our minds, we're thinking about the past, the future, the email I forgot to send, the row that we just had with somebody, or we're anticipating with somebody. We're thinking, thinking, thinking the whole time. We're not actually uh, present with what we're doing. The opposite of the narrative state is the direct state, where we're paying attention directly to what's going, what we are seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching, and so forth. So then the first part of the definition is paying attention to the present moment, as opposed to narrative mode, we're in direct mode. Deliberately, because it's not something that happens by accident, we really need to intentionally focus our mind on what's happening here and now. And non-judgmentally. Non, um, this is something that most of us find incredibly difficult to do, because we all require our critical faculty in our professional life and at home. And when I say judgmental, I'm not talking about morally judgmental, I'm just simply talking about, you know, is it faster or slower or hotter or colder or whatever it is, we're making judgments the whole time about people just from the way they look and speak and so forth. So when we practice non-judgmental uh, abiding in the present moment, we are deliberately switching off that subject of that, that, that critical faculty. And most of us find it very difficult. Uh, I teach mindfulness in the corporate uh, environment and not so long ago I had a group of people who I introduced to a very nice gentle breath counting technique. And at the end of the five-minute session, I said to everyone, so how was it for you? 
And uh, one of the ladies said, well, it went quite well for a couple of minutes, and then I started feeling really anxious. I thought, how can you possibly feel anxious breathing? Um, and she said, well, basically what it was, about halfway through, I remembered reading in an article that unless you fill your lungs with air, you don't breathe properly. So she slipped straight into the narrative mode there. Um, and then she wrestled for the rest of the session, should I be breathing in deeply and taking nice big lungfuls of air, but on the other hand, David didn't say anything about that, or should I just breathe normally? And so even as some, something as simple as taking a breath, we can make a judgment about, and it can cause us to be anxious. Uh, it's really quite fascinating. So basically, mindfulness is paying attention to the present moment deliberately and non-judgmentally. You may be asking, well, then, or uh, wondering, well, if that's mindfulness, what is meditation? Uh, meditation in this particular context is when we decide to uh, apply mindfulness to a particular object for a particular period of time. Now, we've got 550 people in this room today. If I was ask, asked you all to please practice mindfulness for one minute and then asked you what you'd been mindful of, some of you may say, well, I was mindful of the sound of the aircon. It's quite loud when nobody's speaking. Um, or you might be mindful of um, the color of my tie, or mindful of my breath, or you could be mindful of any number of things. But when we practice meditation, we focus on just one object, and it could be any number of things like a breath, a mantra, a visualization, and they all have different purposes and different benefits. Or you could decide, and, and also you decide to be mindful for, say, five minutes or ten minutes, whatever the case may be. So that in, uh, that in very brief terms is mindfulness and meditation. Uh, uh, what is the relationship between the two? Well, meditation is to a mindful life as going to the gym is to a fit and healthy life. So there's, there's so many parallels between mind training and physical training. They are very, very similar. And it's basically the more you practice, the better you get at it, and the more uh, naturally things arise during the day. I mean, often we, we focus when we're at the gym or doing yoga or, or bike riding or whatever your, your chosen way of keeping fit. We focus on that, the elements of that particular practice. But the reason we're doing that is not for the 20 minutes or half an hour we're doing that every day. It's for the 23 hours, 23.5 hours of the rest of the day where we benefit from improved cardiovascular fitness, improved you know, weight resistance, flexibility, whatever it may be that we're training for. And it's just the same with mindfulness and meditation. Although we may focus on the fact that this morning I'm gonna do some breath-based meditation or I'm gonna do a visualization. We get involved in the nuts and bolts. But the reason we're doing it is for the 23 hours that we're not meditating. We're just that much more calmer. We're able to deal with a whole lot of things uh, much more effectively than we would otherwise. So that brings me on to the benefits of, uh, of meditation. I'm keeping a close eye on the time because I know we've got 20 minutes, haven't we? And um, so um, <clears throat> if I can just run through very briefly, the number one, perhaps the, the best researched benefit of mindfulness is stress management. This goes back to the 1980s when Dr. Herbert Benson of Harvard Medical School, <clears throat> who's actually a heart specialist, noticed that some of his patients who had med uh, meditation training recovered far more rapidly than those who did not. And so he discovered this thing called the self-repair mechanism. When we meditate, our bodies go into self-repair mode. When we're in our normal working life, we're subject to quite a lot of low-level ongoing stress. Our bodies are constantly producing uh, adrenaline and cortisol in order to deal with it. The moment we sit down and meditate, apart from the, the physical changes that we can notice for ourselves, like the slowing of the breath, the slowing of the heartbeat, the dropping of heart pressure, of sort of blood pressure and so forth, apart from those things which we can subjectively experience, beneath the threshold of our consciousness, a whole lot of interesting things occur. So instead of producing endorphins and cortisol, we start to produce, sorry, um, adrenaline and cortisol, we start to produce endorphins, which are immune bolstering uh, hormones. Uh, we produce a lot more DHEA, which is a, a steroid which uh, declines with age. In fact, you know, when people meditate for five years or longer, not in one stretch, I always uh, hasten to add, <laughs> they have a biological age 12 years less than their chronological age. 12 years. It's astonishing. Um, but there are more and more benefits that are coming out. So the, there are many physical benefits from simply practicing meditation for a few minutes every day. Um, there are also a lot of um, psychological benefits which we can bring directly into the workplace. The most obvious is that when we're focusing our mind on just one thing, we get better and better at it. And that is one of the most transferable skills you can imagine. Um, if you are good at just focusing on your breath or just on a mantra or whatever the case may be, then when you sit down in front of your computer and you need to analyze this Excel spreadsheet or write a report or reply to a whole bunch of emails. You can just power through that work without being distracted by the pinging of your inbox or the Facebook messages or whatever it is, is distractions may be. You become far more focused because 
The more you do it, the better you get at it. Second of all, clarity comes into play. Um, when you settle your mind, you can start to see all sorts of things that you couldn't see before. Um, I use the analogy often of a glass of storm water, you know, after one of these downpours. If you scoop that up, you can't see anything through it. It's just full of sediment that's bubbling away. But rest that glass on a table for 20 minutes. The sediment settles, you can see right through it. And it's exactly the same with our minds. Our minds are naturally in a state of great agitation. If you haven't tried meditating before, we will in a few moments, and you'll discover for yourself, if you haven't already, your mind is completely out of control. You know, it's, it, it is, and it's, it's alarming to make that discovery. You can't even think about something for five minutes without the mind going into a thousand different directions. So when we settle our minds and we get good at learning how to settle it, we can start to achieve clarity. Neuroscientists, again, have studied the brains of meditators, and they show that when we meditate, we produce more gamma waves. Gamma waves, as best described in terms of the effect, is much the same as the difference between an orchestra that's tuning up and an orchestra whose conductor has, is conducting. You know, everything comes together in the right way, in the right sequence, the whole of orchestra experience. It's the same with our brains, we meditate. I could tell you so many stories about things that I've seen, commercial opportunities that have become, I've become very aware of, um, simply by meditating. I'm not trying to think about them, I'm trying to think about my breath or something else. But they pop into your mind because your mind has that clarity. And uh, that's, I'm not the only one. You speak to any meditator, they'll tell you the same thing. So um, focus, clarity, stress management, um, also our, our neuroplasticity changes as our brains change. I think you'll all have come across the book by Norman Doidge, The Brain That Changes Itself. Um, that's another, you know, there, there are so many fasc fascinating bits of work that are done. Another good one to read is Stumbling on Happiness by Daniel Gilbert, the prof of psych at Harvard. And they're all pointing to the same, many, many, many benefits of meditation and mindfulness. Um, turning briefly in the corporate sector, um, there are many benefits for organizations that start to apply mindfulness in the workplace. Um, I do, more and more, of, in fact, people are coming in to ask me to do uh, mindfulness programs, which is kind of encouraging. Um, some of the most obvious benefits are in, in London Underground, they did a, a survey around a team of people that they brought in to meditate, and they found among those who meditated, um, absentee levels dropped by 50% uh, after the mindfulness intervention than, than amongst the control sample. Um, another interesting thing was the uh, staff turnover was dramatically reduced uh, amongst people who uh, were meditators. Uh, far better interpersonal uh, skills and, and teamwork was displayed by people who meditate. And that comes as no surprise. My partner Claire Goodman and I have a, a company called Organizational Mindfulness, or OM, haha. Um, and at OM we found that in, in little organizations where, we've, or organizations where we've introduced mindfulness, some fascinating things have happened, like there's one in particular that springs to mind. These two women really just did not get on. It was an older lady and a younger one, and they just rubbed each other the wrong way the whole time. And everyone in the office knew about it. And they're, they're, you know, there's all this sort of dancing around the, the edges and trying to avoid conflict between these two. But the, as it happened, I didn't know anything about this. They came to the same meditation sessions over a period of six weeks. And at the end of it, a couple of months later, I went into the organization and said, so, how's it all going, and boom, 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 and somebody said to me, you know, there's been the most remarkable transformation. These two women who, they seem to almost just like, without saying anything, draw a line in the sand, let go of all their past uh, dissension, and just move on and be supportive. And in fact, now they're incredibly supportive of each other. Um, and that came as real no surprise, because when we practice meditation, especially mindfulness-based uh, meditation, we learn to let go of this cognitive chatter that goes to our mind, and to see it for what it is, is cognitive chatter. You know, our thoughts are just thoughts. They're not facts, they're not truths, they're not beliefs, they're just cognitive chatter. And the less we can, um, we, we kind of uh, attached we become to them, uh, the, the more we can just let go of them, um, we can then start to acknowledge the fact that, you know, we can actually like somebody even if we disagree with them. We can actually like somebody very much, even though we might disagree with a lot of what they say. And that's a wonderful discovery for some people to make. So better teamwork is another uh, benefit of mindfulness in the workplace. And um, we are ra racing against the clock here, but one last thing I just want to mention about mindfulness in corporate places is mindful leadership. You know, the best predictor of an effective leader uh, has got nothing to do with how hard they will work uh, um, or how intelligent that person is even. It's not intelligence or hard work. Uh, it has everything to do with emotional intelligence, or i.e. delayed gratification, um, and social intelligence, how good you are at empathizing with others, winning them over, getting them on board. And those are the predictors of, 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 of mindful leadership, of effective leadership. And, and more and more studies have been done now on the importance of mindful leadership. It's not just about 
the intellectual stuff and the intellectual capabilities. He's got for, far more to do with um, emotional uh, intelligence and social intelligence. So we have just a few minutes before, um, before tea, um, and what I'd like to do is just talk you through very briefly um, through an, uh, a mind, sorry, a breath-based meditation. Um, so I'll talk you through the, the best posture. Um, you can sit on a, a normal chair that's perfectly all right. I'm not expecting you to float about in, in the full lotus position. Um, but you may want to offload anything on your laps. Um, just turn, you don't you can turn with your backs to me, that's fine. Just turn wherever's comfortable and um, plant your feet solidly on the ground. The most important thing in any meditation exercise is to keep a straight spine, okay? Um, so I always urge people, BBC, bum and back of chair, that helps you keep a nice uh, straight spine. Plant your feet firmly on the ground. You can have your hands in, you know, there are very few thou shalts and thou shalt nots about meditation. You can either have your hands on your knees or like that. You know, you always see the images of normally very attractive young girls on the beach sitting in, <laughs> and magazines and forests for some reason. But anyway, um, you can do that. But I, I learned just to put my right hand on my left and join the thumbs, You're closing the circuit. Okay. Keep your, um, your shoulders just nicely rolled back. Um, and with your head, you can adjust the, your tilt of your head. So if you're feeling a little agitated right now, a lot of stuff goes through your mind, um, it's better to tilt your head slightly lower. Uh, if on the other hand, you're feeling a little bit drowsy, uh, then maybe keep your head more upright. Um, Either close your eyes or just have a point a meter or two ahead of you, just fix it in a slightly uh, unfocused uh, way. Just park your eyes there um, and you know, put the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth. So you're now in the seven point meditation posture, believe it or not. Okay, that's the right optimal physical posture in which to meditate. And I want to um, reassure you we'll only be meditating for five minutes, so it's not going to go on for long. As important as being in the right physical posture is being in the right psychological posture. So you need to just give yourself permission for the next five minutes, I don't have to think about anything apart from my breath. I give myself permission not to have to think about anything that's happened up till now in my life or that'll happen afterwards. Try as far as possible simply to be pure consciousness, without a past, without a future, simply abiding in the here and now. And having given yourself that permission, it's always good to start with an objective in mind, I just think that by the practice of this meditation, I am becoming calm and relaxed, happier and more efficient in all that I do, both for my own sake, as well as for others. So by the practice of this meditation, I am becoming calm and relaxed, happier and more efficient in all that I do, both for my own sake, as well as for others. And what I'd like you to do now, please, for the next three breaths, is to focus on the inhalation as you inhale through your left nostril and exhale through your right. Then, for the subsequent three breaths, focus on inhaling through your right nostril and exhaling through your left. And then finally, for the last three breaths, inhaling and exhaling through both nostrils. Now, the objective here is not to manipulate your breath so that you're only breathing through one nostril. What you're doing is focusing on breathing through one nostril at a time. As we get a little bit further into the meditation, try and be even more forensic in paying attention to every element of each breath. Notice how each inhalation begins and builds and tapers. Observe the gap between in-breath and out-breath. Notice how every exhalation begins and builds and tapers. 
usually a longer gap between exhalation and inhalation. We have just one minute of this session left. Whatever the state of your mind has been for the previous few minutes, try and make these last 60 seconds as focused as possible. By the practice of this meditation, I am becoming calm and relaxed, happier and more efficient in all that I do, both for my own sake as well as for others. And in your own time, open your eyes and come back to the room. I'm not sure uh, how you're feeling after that, but it's amazing how just a few minutes of meditation can create real systemic peacefulness. And that's less than two commercial breaks in television. So, it's astonishing what transformation is possible in such a short period of time. Um, I really you know, could speak literally for hours on meditation, something I'm very passionate about, as you will have gathered. Um, but the most, uh, just, just while I remember, if, any, if anyone wants to go to my website, you can download free guided meditations, including that one. So if you'd like to, it's like stabilizer wheels on a kid's bike. You know, it's useful to have while you're still learning to be on the big two-wheeler. Um, so feel free. Um, I just want to end by saying, you know, meditation has so many benefits, which I've talked about, stress management, clarity, focus, emotional resilience and regulation. Um, and as well as all the corporate and operational benefits, organizational benefits. Um, but for me personally, the most profound and life-changing benefit is the fact of discovering what my own mind actually is. Because you, know, you can have a head full of ideas, like if you study psychology, as I did, about what is the mind. But the only way you can actually truly find out what mind is, the only useful way is to experience it directly and firsthand. Meditation gives us that opportunity. And when we do, we make the discovery that we have all, each of us has within him or herself, a wellspring of peacefulness, boundless tranquility. We all have it. It's already there. We don't need to manufacture or fabricate it. It's right there. All we need are the tools to, if you like, mine it, to find it, to extract that resource. But we all already possess that. And I would really encourage all of you to give serious thought to doing that because for me, it's been the most life-changing thing, the most profoundly beneficial thing, and, and I'm sure, absolutely sure it could be for you too. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>